Uh, it's 11 45. Let's get started. Um, good morning, and uh, my name is uh, Kiran Baskar, and uh, I'm uh, co director of uh, the Behavior Health Institute with Dr. Rudhina Bukirava. Uh, so, we both uh, co direct uh, this important uh, signature program uh, at UNM. Um, so, it's, it's, it's really you know, fascinating to see that you know, uh, we have so much neuroscience research that's going on. Uh, in our campus, and, and uh, I'm so glad that uh, uh, you know people could participate, and, and also um, you know thanks to those, especially the trainees and the community members who could who could come and uh, in person and, and participate in this uh, important event. Um, Dr. Bhatiyawa is going to tell you all the sort of you know how over the years has progressed, and, and where where do we stand in terms of like the number of participants and, and things like that, but. But I really want to, you know, uh, take a moment uh, just to uh, again uh, thank all the people who, who are involved in planning and everything uh, this event, and, and also want to give you an overview of uh, uh, this DBHS signature program which we have been running for the past uh, several years and uh, and go from there. So um, just briefly, uh, you know, uh, let's see. Once this, so just yesterday we had a great, uh, you know, talk from my department chair, Dr. Wilder. I know some of you might have attended that. You know, uh, he was uh, recognized for um, for his research accomplishment uh, in the area of pathology, and, uh, and and it was really nice. And I hope that you know, um, charisma and, uh, and the energy still flows through and uh, sort of blesses us in terms of uh, brand behavior research issues that. Uh, uh, we all have been doing um, yeah. on, on campus. So, uh, so with that, uh, I just want to uh, just say a few few things. But before that, I really want to uh, start by uh, you know acknowledging the land we sit in. Uh, you know, we founded in uh, 1889 the University of Phoenix. So it sits on um, the traditional homelands of Pueblo of Sandia, the original peoples of New Mexico, Pueblo, Navajo, and Apache. Uh, since time uh, immemorial, immemorial have deep connections to the land and have made significant contributions uh, to the broader community statewide. We honor the land itself and uh, those who remain uh, stewards of this land throughout the generations and also acknowledge our committed relationship to indigenous people and uh, we uh, truly and gratefully made our history. Um, so the Brain and Behavioral Health Research Institute you know, started uh, um, It started uh, several years ago, and uh, Dr. Bakirwa and myself, you know, we uh, inherited from Dr. Bill Shadwork, you know, who had uh, set a nice stage for this program um, uh, early on, and then um, with the mission that in the the, the the goal is to improve the brain and behavioral health of all New Mexico. So that with that goal, you know, it was established uh, about eight to ten years ago, I would imagine. Um, and I was one of the you know faculty hires as a part of this, you know, uh, joined in my genetics microbiology department um, under the some this DBHA signature program, uh, you know, to expand uh, and and also contribute to this program. So I'm really proud of that, uh, you know, to be to, to be part of this this. Uh, uh, BHI, uh, uh, initiative. So, uh, you know, the BBHA community engagement and partnership goal again is to facilitate and establish partnership um, with BBHA affiliates and community store in Mexico. It's not just, you know, with, you know, partnership between research and within UNM, but also uh, engage community members who uh, tirelessly, you know, um, um, you know, work on multiple brain disease initiatives and uh, help people who are suffering from uh, various kinds of brain diseases and, and, and sort of bring the folks to the researchers, you know, who find cures for some of those diseases. So that's the partnership we really wanted to establish. And, and also, of course, to support major research programs in the in the area. So as you can see, you know, the uh, uh, BHI has representation from all the different organizations, uh, different departments, uh, other uh, divisions and, and centers. Um, I'm not going 
So again, um, the leadership, myself, uh, you know, I, I got to the Kirva, and of course, um, we have uh, most of you already received a lot of communication from uh, in the uh, branch, you know, we have tell the you know, uh, this program behind the scene. And um, we also have an awesome advisory uh, board, uh, which are listed here, as well as uh, the departments who are also advising in terms of uh, strategic planning of the EHI and, uh, and uh, including the research uh, day that, that, that is happening today. Uh, so, we, the EHI, again, I just said, you know, some of the things that, uh, that we also want to do in addition to the research day, as I said, you know, is to uh, to have the health education rights uh, and uh, and some of the support from the board facilities that would help uh, the researchers uh, with their research needs and uh, uh, and also provide some pilot funding uh, in the area of brain and behavior research uh, who can use these board facilities and generate some preliminary data from some real um, kinds of applications and things. Um, so that's all the overview of uh, similarity these uh, the behavior does. Um, and also, again, there's a lot of community engagement around which uh, that uh, we will be you know, some of the, uh, you know, one of the foundations uh, that uh, we said here are uh, just a few examples with uh, whom we partner with, and, and also with an example here with the BHA with the national alliance of better business and housing, which are the key project that we have in the so we try to, you know, uh, do that and bring together all the community and the one of the sports. And uh, the way we want to communicate our activities and upcoming events is through the venues on the newsletter, which comes as part of me. So, what you are um, are used to seeing this in in uh, emails uh, in all of our uh, upcoming uh, seminars, uh, which are listed here, and also from the other um, recognition awards and all sorts of you know community uh, events are also uh, captured in this main uh, uh, news portal. So we also. Um, you know, have a dedicated website where we sort of, uh, you know, encourage people to go uh, visit and, and explore grant opportunities, the many grant programs, um, and, and also, you know, list of some of the upcoming events, which you can see. I think most of you have uh, quite familiar, at least uh, the, the event of our next community. Um, so, I, again, I encourage you to, to use our website and, and to uh, to learn about uh, some of the core decisions and pilot programs that PBHA offers. So, I think uh, what I'll do right now is um, at this point of time, when it comes to money, I will hand over to everybody. You know, <laughs> so, it's pretty good in, you know, sort of change into some of the, the dollar aspect of our PBHA program. So, yeah, let's move Good afternoon. How is everybody doing? Good. So good to see, good to see all of you. We are just doing this brief BBHI update, like here at a glance. Something we haven't done before, just to show how much of research in this area we have going on. So these numbers don't represent rigor necessarily or importance of a topic, but they are kind of an indirect reflection of uh, how much funding our investigators bring to make hopefully a difference, make difference for our patients, make difference for our communities. Um, this is just like a highlight uh, of total, we are close to 10 million, million in funding uh, in the area supported by Brain Behavioral Health Institute. Again, like this includes not just substance use, but other areas. And this is just like representation of some what we call uh, center level grants. We have several center grants focusing on brain behavioral health issues. So undeniably, this is one of the strengths of our institution, and we are honored to support it. Uh, we also, in, in addition to these large center grants, we have a number of junior investigators and trainees 
doing research in this area. So this is excellent to see. And this is this, this is the data from 2022 only. Uh, another major achievement last year was a new building. How many of you know about the new building? It's called ISUBI, Interdisciplinary Substance Use and Brain Injury Building. But just showing on the map where it is, it's, it's the red box in addition, uh, kind of behind the mine research network and the miniature pool. And that's a shared research core facility, designated to foster cross discipline collaboration and facilitate scientific discoveries. It will allow us to bring uh, new clinical trials, evaluate novel therapeutic approaches in patients with chronic pain, substance use disorders, and brain injury. So the building has completed. We had a ribbon cutting ceremony in February, uh, just like some of the leadership uh, from the uh, award ceremony. So it's fantastic. Now we are moving the equipment in and we are ready to start this cutting edge, uh, cutting edge multidisciplinary trials. And this brings us to this day, to today. So people who are coming in from the poster session, feel free to come, come forward. There is still a lot of room up front. Um, BBHI Research Day um, is growing. So I'm showing some statistics from 2022. And you can see last year we had 2012 participants. We are close to 300 this year. This is really a huge achievement for us. We feel this is a platform for us to network, to meet new colleagues, to build our communities. Uh, we have a representation from 41 UNM departments and centers. The poster session we just concluded uh, included 80 posters, and we, we have to cap it 80. We had more submissions just because we were running out of what we were at capacity. Um, and I think another major achievement, we had 38 external organizations represented in this event. So this is not just HSC, this is not UNM main campus, this is our community in New Mexico events. I want to emphasize uh, that the focus area for 2023 is substance use, misuse, and substance use disorders. This area is very near and dear to my heart. I'm a director of the Substance Use Research and Education Center. Um, in addition to the Shore Center, we have three other major centers focusing on this topic area at UNM. Of course, CASA, Center for Alcoholism, Substance Abuse, and Addiction. Uh, Southwest uh, Clinical Trial Network and the UNM New Mexico Alcohol Research Center. And of course, in addition to these centers, we have a lot of investigator initiated projects and grants and community engagement activities going on. I would be amiss if I didn't use this opportunity, these 300 participants, to mention that College of Pharmacy Shore Center has an open tenure track position. Uh, we are looking for assistant associate professor and expertise in social behavioral data sciences, sciences, and particular expertise in substance use disorder. If, so if you know somebody, the search is open, they can still apply. Okay, the overview of, of today. So we already uh, uh, had a very successful poster session, and uh, we will transition to the keynote presentation momentarily. Uh, after the keynote presentation, where I got the launch distribution, so please note it's in, in the other Dominici Northwest building. If you exit this, this auditorium, it's on the right. Uh, and a lunch, a lunch distribution will be on the second floor. So room 2710. If you're registered for lunch, please pick up a box and then transition to the third floor. So all other activities in the afternoon will be in the third, uh, on the third floor. At 1.30, we have a round table discussion. Uh, moderated by Jeremy Light. Uh, and the focus of our roundtable discussion is improving systems of care in New Mexico for substance use disorders. We have outstanding panel uh, participating in this roundtable uh, discussion, and we're really hoping that we will, we will bring you questions for, um, uh, for the panelists. After that, immediately after that, we will have a New Mexico Brain Blast. That's something new we are doing this year. It's kind of like a third that style talks of one slide, three minutes, per person, uh, five trainees. So very quickly, trainees will need to tell about the main message of their research. Again, the opportunities to exchange ideas, poster collaborations. And then we will conclude with uh, closing remarks and poster award presentation. So faith is actually 
very busy outside of the room, telling all the scores. So we will have announcements in the afternoon. I want to acknowledge uh, everybody who made this event possible. This is a list of sponsors. It wouldn't be possible to do this large event without them. It's probably one of the largest uh, scientific exchanges on campus. Uh, every all post of judges, we in depth to your time, expertise, and commitment. Thank you. Uh, we have a lot of volunteers. As, uh, this is this is not a comprehensive list, but it's most of the people. Actually, I, I would I really appreciate if anybody, uh, all the volunteers and judges, would stand up. That we don't have kind of a boss. Thank you, and huge thanks to uh, Faith Brand, my BBHA program manager, who she starts working to plan this event in November. So this is just like how much it takes. In the last three months, is is just ramping up. Uh, it's very intense. So we are in depth to Faith, and. Finally, it's my distinct pleasure to present our keynote presenter, uh, Ted Alcorn. Ted is a freelance journalist. Uh, he has a master's degree in international affairs from the School of Advanced International Studies, John Hopkins University. He also has a master's of health sciences and international health, um, also from Johns Hopkins University. Uh, and um, he, he is associate professor of epidemiology at Columbia. Um, as well as adjunct assistant professor at New York University uh, School of Public Service. Uh, Ted published feature stories in the leading national publications, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Atlantic. So we are truly honored to have such a prominent journalist. And that's again something we are doing differently this year. Instead of a clinician or PhD scientist, we felt like the topic of substance use and alcoholism really requires like broader community input and a perspective. So we felt that uh, Todd, who spent uh, uh, who spent number of years writing about New Mexico, he has a, a publication series about uh, uh, drunk driving, reporting the Mexican electric crisis of alcohol-related deaths. And I'm quoting one of his uh, uh, one of his uh, uh, Quotes from his from his articles: Alcohol is killing New Mexico at a higher rate than everywhere in the country. Yet the state has largely neglected the growing crisis. So hopefully today we will initiate the dialogue. What can be done differently? So after after the keynote presentation, again we have this roundtable discussions where we can address additional questions. So it's my distinct pleasure to welcome Ted Alcohol. Thank you. Is the audio working okay? Okay, great. Um, I'm so grateful to be invited here today. Um, and I noticed that for this flyer, they put me on with a big brain, and that's like, that really gives you imposter syndrome. Um, but uh, if that was going to have to say, well, I'm the poster session today, where the first sentence from the study, then I have the word in it. Um, there's a lot of smarts in this room, and I feel like a little bit of an interloper. But I do think I have a very different, probably, role in the, the final reaction that we have to this issue. And it's really, really wonderful for me to have a little bit of dialogue with a group like this that is really advancing the science and understanding like at the boundaries of what we know. It's really complicated set of issues. And, and a journalist's role, I think, is really different in terms of. Taking some of that information, the delivering some of the people out there might need to identify and, and trying to communicate with them to and with the public. And so um, I don't think I honestly am trying to present much that a lot of people in this room don't know. And they may say a few things that are incorrect, but hopefully um, you can see me how I've been talking about this and written about this and what I've learned about it and been about a lot of the public and lawmakers about it. Um, We'll give you just a little bit of a sense about how many of the work you're doing does contribute to those bigger conversations and similarly how, how other reporters and other people in the community should become and tap expertise clearly that are here. 
Um, so it looks like we're good. And is this thing that we did? Yeah. Um, I already have such a speed introduction. I'll skip over that. But this is that I for a Google and Google that. Okay, let me see. Sorry about that. Give it a second. Um, you have to get right now. Yeah, let me start the same. It's always a technical question. Okay, so, um, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay, so just to sort of set a caveat, um, I my intention today is basically to describe perhaps what you will, what you already know, but what is the state of alcohol's impact on the state of New Mexico, um, based on some of the reporting that I've done. Part of that reporting, I think, for the public is to summarize a little bit about what the evidence is about what we can do about it as a society. And here, I think you're really focused. My sense is very focused on what you can do for individual people for those brains. That you're looking at, I'm kind of looking at our societal brain, I guess. I'm sort of out looking at the population and then I'm looking at our societal reaction to it and how does our society react to this issue or not. Um, and then hopefully, in just showing the journalistic process, I'll tell you, it'll show you a little bit about how I spend things that engaging audience on the topic. I will not provide any remarkable new expert findings because I really, although I've been reporting on behavioral health issues, criminal justice, public health for you know about a decade, I really have only focused on alcohol for the last couple of years. So I'm a baby and learning about this myself. And then um, and I will also say, although as a reporter, I mean that too. Okay. So as a reporter, I will um I will not advocate for any policy here. You know, I'm I'm trying to provide evidence about what the science says that we should do. Um, but uh, you know, I'm not trying to take a position about what we should do. So um, I've done some reporting on this nationwide, and it's clearly it's not just a New Mexican problem. And alcohol plays a role in our society in a lot of complicated ways. It's an incredibly, you know, it's an ancient art form making. Making alcohol, some of the brewers I've talked to say they have the oldest profession known to man. Um, and I think a lot of people enjoy alcohol in their lives, including myself. I don't think that the alcohol industry needs uh, a lot of help from reporters to sort of articulate that aspect of it. So, what I'm really focused on is that there seems to be a lot of neglect, which is the harms that, that it can have society and increasingly. Um, and the numbers you are familiar with probably are start at the population level. Although this is a huge business, people estimate it's over a trillion dollar global business. Um, in the United States, it's also been you know, it's an ongoing catastrophe, um, killing more than 140,000 people per year in the last few years, um, particularly people in the youngest part of their life. And um, and those numbers have been increasing during the preceding and during the pandemic as as our uh, drinking behaviors have continued to evolve. And I've been reporting on um, the toll of those deaths, um, on what we know about the science. Uh, this is about um, naltrexone, uh, you know, offering naltrexone to people to reduce binge drinking. I've been focused a little bit on the soda makers who are now launching alcohol products for the first time, Pepsi, Coca-Cola, Monster Beverage. Just saw there's a uh, alcoholic semi D now on the Walmart shelves. So. The market for these products is shifting, and these are huge businesses that really can change the drinking environment, and they're driven by profits, and that is that is coming to the people that you care about. Um, but really, I've done most of my reporting on this issue in New Mexico, and as I said, I grew up here um, in the 90s mostly, and was aware, obviously, that alcohol was a problem in New Mexico. Grew up with my parents talking to me about EWI specifically, and with a vague understanding that the state, although it had had a big problem with EWI, had actually done a really good job addressing it. 
And so I thought maybe I knew everything I was to know about alcohol in New Mexico. And the part process of recording is really like, I didn't know I did. And that in fact, alcohol, even for somebody who's like me who's interested in public health and from here, is an emergency in plain sight. It really is clearly the numbers will and will speak to this. All right, it's having such an impact. And I think even pretty sophisticated consumers of information in this state don't know it. And that was the purpose of this reporting. Um, so I love take these numbers and trying to find out of data. This is this is really a significant series in the amount of time that my outlet in Mexico Death and I put into it. Um, I conducted you know, over 200 people. I know maybe a couple of people in this room are on those numbers. Um, and all the New Mexico Death, I highly recommend you subscribe to their e newsletter, um, which is their in-depth in investigative nonpartisan news. Um, we've also had a lot of help from the newspapers around the state that have republished this work. And it wouldn't have been possible without support from foundations to do it. Um, the German of this series, in case you're interested, was science, was data, something much more simplistic than the stuff that I'm seeing out in the in the hallways here. But just when I was my editor asked me to look at alcohol and its, and its uh, implications in the COVID pandemic. Um, Someone went across this actual table with alcohol uh, involved death rates by state, which New Mexico is at the top, and not just at the top by a little, but top, at the top by head and shoulders. And for me, as I said, that was a surprise to recognize, even for a state that I knew struggled this issue, that were so far outside of other states, which really led to the development of the series. Um, and I think this is an oversimplification, but the popular narratives around alcohol that you see in the press and that maybe we think about uh, in the wider public are the one we think about alcohol problems as a criminal, problem, as a thing that we other here you see a uh, near tragedy in Gallup where the a man who's intoxicated running into the brain last year, where the papers run a mug shot, which is not a good practice in journalism to begin with, but really saying this is a problem of some people that aren't like us. I think that's the way that we need to bring this conversation. Or the thing about it is a business success. Here, with the new alcohol licenses that were issued in the last year, the regulatory division is saying because businesses were taking up these licenses, that was that was wildly successful. So that's the story they run. It's not talking about the full implications of increasing. Output uh, density and output and alcohol access. And then, of course, talking to our leaders again, just occasionally, I used to be as with their um, drinking behaviors, and so that also can, can show up. But I think the popular story is really not about the public health aspects of this. So, for me, the reporting process often starts with data. Um, and because so much of what we don't know, we, we know very little, obviously, but the most harmful thing is sometimes. Things we don't know, we didn't know. Um, and so I find it's always better to go back to the ground to what we can measure, what we can look at. And for me, that means you know, data that I can manipulate and fix it up, basically. But um, in this case, this is just an example of a lot of different data that I pulled from state and local and federal agencies. This happened to be um, PWI traffic, um, stable traffic accident data, including alcohol involvement, which shows after a lot of tinkering, I determined the limitations. Interpret this for you is that in the 90s, New Mexico really did have a really high rate of DMV and it caught a huge decline starting in the early 90s, but continuing to return with the state of water. Um, so the narrative I have about the state coming up with some of the natural rate was after it. But I know it's not going to have to have those, those changes at the bottom of the going back in the last couple years. PWI rates here per vehicle and how it's kind of increased. And um, this the simplistic term of the PWI, which all PWI or the tools that we have to address it, our division is is in yeah, we really need to even continue thinking about that part of the problem. Um, but I was trying to zoom out and look at, at alcohol's impact on the state more broad and at preventing the findings. But these are kind of when they kind of come with general public kind of look series of that. One, I think the thing that I'm is that New Mexico really does have an extraordinary alcohol related death. Um, our national, compared to the national rate, we're, we're true. More, double the number of people are dying of alcohol related causes compared to all the other substances that people overdose on the state combined. They get, I would say, a lot of, lately, a lot of attention in the past. 
Well, what's in that basket of alcohol attributable death? And that's kind of like a mouthful. Um, he's a jargon, but I've come to learn and examine that uh, metric, which is really my explanation of how the total impact on fatality in the state. And as I've come to learn, it's been up to as many different impacts on the body and brain. Um, and we're, when we're entering dense, obviously, we're just looking at the tip of the iceberg. But I'm all the beautiful deaths are looking at the death certificates, right? That are clearly related to the alcohol, but also those we have crunching the material alcohol, where we estimate that and we estimate for a friend cancer, for hypothermia, for violence, homicide, and suicide. And when you put them in those together, you start to see how much impact on the state is it's not what people want to think. It's not only going to be all of that up share. It is someone people who overdose on alcohol and particularly in public places for overdoses, but mostly it's on liver disease, violence here, um, and associated injury. So um, this partially speaks to why the the harms of alcohol I think are much bigger than people realize. A lot of these deaths are, are occurring in hospitals and ICUs behind closed doors, and certainly wrapped in a stigma. The families and individuals don't often end up talking about these, these deaths. Another problem, I think, is who we think is being harmed most by alcohol. And early in my reporting, when I was from talking this work, and other people, I think people from a wide range of possible political spectrum would say, well, what is what is what is the thing that you have to do? Does this have to do with high rate of alcohol related deaths among Native Americans? When you get something like that, way, you get something like there's a huge history of racism and stereotypes around Native people and their relationship with alcohol that exists to this day. And it's uh, clearly a picture of what you all um, are wrestling with. Um, so it's clear to the Native people as a whole. Uh, and I don't know if you know what this kind of experience is. It's a scientist that communicated to me in a common fashion that there is no. Intrinsically, some of the risk of alcohol dependence or alcohol related harms in these native people that can be separated, can, can be separated from the unequal treatment of the native people here in the United States. The historical chronological conditions that they exist today. And yet, those disparities in that are very real. And here you see the native people in this city do have a much higher rate of alcohol related disease and deaths. But if every population group in Mexico has a higher rate of alcohol related disease that then it appears nationwide. So it's kind of complicated. And what I want to say from this is one, this is an issue that really does exaggerate and reflect deep inequities in New Mexico that we still need to address. What do we need to address? But also, it's not a problem that is owned by one part of the population here. It's not a problem that we can say, oh, it's a problem. We'll pass away for 10 if it walks the front. All population groups in the United States have a stage in proving how we drink this. And how we how we drink, basically. So for me, uh, the reporting process has meant trying to catch up with all of you probably by reading everything I could in the scientific literature, the gray kind of literature, going back and learning some of the history of people, you know, who received this center, who spent their years and careers uh, studying and helping me understand. Stand on their shoulders, the epidemiology of um, both of alcohol impact on New Mexico, but also a lot of the work that's been done over the years. Um, and then honing in on what we can do. 
And I know that there's a lot of what we can do. So for a reporter, it's sort of like, well, where's the science the strongest? Where are the things that I can, can communicate to the lay public? And some of the most important ideas that, that seem to be worth getting across to people, and there's a lot of things that we can do in basic public health that have been vetted by the CDC, independent presented through the task force, to save the drinking environment, change not only how we treat people who already have an alcohol use disorder, but how do we affect the whole population of drinkers so that sure people end up developing this disorder? How do we change that? And then, you know, the, the science that has been developed and is uh, analyzed by this independent task force says there's a pretty good population in taking measures. Some of them reducing or changing the price of alcohol, changing its accessibility, changing hours of days of sale. Um, and forcing over service law and so forth. When I went to the Department of Health here in New Mexico and asked, How are you doing on these measures? How are you doing on these kind of measures? Well, turns out we're moving on shores, or we need to be on more than that. So, if you really think, What's the state doing to make this country clean environment? Then, pretty much, it keeps you. Okay. Three of seven is the thing I'm ready in, in my class. Okay. So, um, this is a big issue, I think. Look, I look around and see what other what we can learn from other states. One of the issues with uh, with alcohol, of course, is that all states seem to be moving in a, in a pretty problematic direction. Alcohol is that for in every state in the country. So there's not necessarily a lot of gold standard places within the U.S. to look at. But some of those population-based measures have been over the last 20 years implemented elsewhere, and there's a study there, and there's you know. A, Wealth of body of knowledge, particularly around changes in alcohol taxes, which marginally change out the price that people pay for alcohol. And so then the states that have increased alcohol taxes after a huge political fight, there have been pretty measurable impacts in alcohol related harm. I grew up here example in Alaska, Illinois, Maryland, um, which alcohol, uh, alcohol taxes where they raise them, sometimes it's a nickel drink. And can show impacts in DWIs, in cirrhosis, in sexually transmitted infections. So, try to bring that information, that knowledge to policymakers and thinkers here when we think about our policies. And what are New Mexico's policies, for example, when it comes to alcohol taxes? Well, it's a little hard to figure this out. Um, the, the statutes are in very complicated, in very complicated units. They're lost over time. Do we still? Database of alcohol taxes over the last 40 years. And what, one of the things that's important to recognize about alcohol taxes is they're set by volume. We tax alcohol by a liter for wine and for um, spirits and by a gallon per beer. So imagine if you set a five cent tax on a uh, gallon, well, let's say $30.40 for a gallon of beer in 1980. Beer's prices have been going up, but the tax doesn't go up. The tax is not indexed to inflation. So every year, as inflation puts the prices up, the real value of these taxes erodes a little bit. As inflation rises, the bigger the tax rate of alcohol gets high. So if you actually adjust for inflation, that's what it's trying to tell you. It's going to give the tax rate for beer, wine, and liquor has been raised twice in the last 40 years, 1983 to 1993. You see those big jumps, and you see them through time or in the past. And where we were last year, 2022, here historically, New Mexico health has been taxed less for standard drink than wine and liquor, about four cents a drink. Um, and those rates are low as they've been in 30 years. So the reporting for me is a little bit different. I have to kind of go in my, go in my gut and anecdote. The data is hopefully a way to guide me to a certain degree of rigor, but otherwise, I'm just trying to see what people are doing. Um, some of them are running along to the state police doing their DWI enforcement. I have spent some time in the county, including the four corners of the center, um, seeing um, some amazing new treatment, um, and including some traditional practices that are being employed there. I matriculated with a group of people who had been convicted of their first DWI and did a state DWI school um, to see how people were processing that error that they made. And on the city was something that I'm probably avoided like repeating it. Um, and so on and so forth. And of course, then I really mostly wanted to speak with people who've been really impacted by this issue. 
and the folks at ASAP, at the, uh, you know, your constellation of uh, institutions were incredibly helpful, along with, you know, the psych, psych clinic. Um, they helped me try to find patients who would be willing to talk with me about how uh, it impacted them and their families. Because I'm here, I'm talking about a big population issue, but also everybody experiences this not as a population, but as a person. And I wanted to see how alcohol was affecting individual people and the people they love. And among those that spoke with this gentleman, Steve was really courageous, and his um, ex wife and his children were also willing to talk to me about how alcohol, his lifelong addiction, dependence on alcohol, it, um, had cost him a lot. It cost him his marriage, his relationship with those kids, his career to a degree, um, and how he kind of slipped through the cracks, even as a successful businessman with a lot of advantages and privileges, um, and how he was pretty much as close as you can get to not surviving this when um, he found his way to the you know, site clinic and then to ASAP. And um, I learned from him because not only about his experience and about how traumatic this can be, but also to see in his case, although he was very fond of his primary care clinician, he and he shared a lot about his drinking with that clinician. That clinician never referred him to treatment, never actually even diagnosed him as having an alcohol use disorder. And I would say, arguably, by prescribing the benzapine and sustaining that prescription when you became dependent on it, it's going to you know, facilitate it. Um, and why that was important for me to learn is it links up with the science on what primary clinicians, the opportunity they have to address this issue that we're missing, not only in New Mexico, but elsewhere. There's some recent research to show that although a lot of people get asked, in that sort of like, uh, you know, pure, that puristic way, I guess, how often do you drink, how much do you drink? For me, very few clinicians follow up that question by asking, by offering and counseling them on when they may be drinking too much. Um, so people are getting sort of screened for their levels of drinking, but then there's not a lot of follow up from the primary care clinicians for a variety of reasons, right? Not only in counseling people on by that brief intervention of reduced drinking, but also connecting them with uh, more intensive resources. And in Steve's case, where uh, a medication became very important, he felt in his recovery, and where clearly for some people, a medication is very effective. Um, very few Mexicans are getting access to those FDA approved medications. And the chart here on the right is from the State Department of Health, where the estimated treatment gap, the estimate of the share of people that have dependent or very substances and then the share that they treatment. And we have for people with an alcohol use disorder is bigger than the amount of all those substances in their state of mind. And I think people have all over to these little neat boxes. But it gives you the sense that there's a lot more people with an alcohol use disorder. So I think that our kind of biggest catchment, the primary care setting, is really not geared up as well as it should be to providing the folks the treatment that they need. And I know the city is interested in doing one of them, but to me, it's not that we can provide these opportunities. That is yet to be taken up. Now, of course, you come into, I come into this issue and you're looking around and saying, why does this problem exist? I'm the first person that has come to this. Clearly, no. And what has been incredibly inspiring and humbling is to see how New Mexicans don't need to be told that this is a problem. New Mexicans have thought of this. And some of the people who have been most committed to it are in the communities that have been most affected by it. And I get her to move them actually by these images with my kind of um, uh, yeah, a group in Gallup in 1989 after a terrible thing where a child was killed. This is somebody who on the to manage it. We have been through the young one, it's not lucky this is the <laughs> They bought 200 miles for 10 days on the freeway, um, kind of storms. Uh, their numbers grew to what is said to be 2,000 people. And they left in the state of and uh, they forced the legislature with a convene about the general hearing to, to hear the demands. And, and, uh, and so it shows, I think, that when people are in the and organized, organized, okay, there's a lot of power in this issue. And it's cool. And then one of the issues. And I think it's one of the things I'm going to put a lot of people in other words to say, this is affecting me, this is affecting my family. Um, and 
In the 90s, that was when we really did last systematically address alcohol, but it was really focused on DWI. The legislature in the years that followed this, right, did some of the, we did some of the things for the first time in this entire country, it required an interlock for people who have been convicted for a CWI offense. Really created the resources to both enforce DWI, but also to provide some rehabilitative, uh, you know, processes for people who've been, been convicted of it. Um, we drove those DWI rates down to the degree that you can, as I say, arguably the clumsy and often harmful tool of the criminal justice system. But we had a very narrow lens. Again, we're focused on DWI, then, and the problem now is DWI is such a small fraction of alcohol's harms, we kind of missed the forest for the trees. And for all people's actions, the people of the Mexican action, my reporting suggests that lawmakers these days have not been listening. Give you an example in 2021, right during the pandemic, we all remember hospitality businesses who were rightly in a you know, calling out for help after a series of lockdowns that really harmed their businesses, um, organized in this state and elsewhere to try and get alcohol sales laws relaxed. This is happening across the country. But a lot of those laws that we have and maintained for a long time around not allowing certain things about alcohol be delivered, not allowing people to take out alcohol from a certain point of um, 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 they fell either temporarily or permanently around the country. And here in New Mexico, where we already have more outlets, alcohol outlets per county than is allowed by statute in Albuquerque and Santa Fe and Gallup and other communities, where we know the density and number of alcohol outlets have been alcohol very locally or in violence, but then on higher alcohol related ways. You know, the state of Alcohol and Media on that the Media Holders looked at this and she wrote a memo. She wrote a memo first to her high left saying, we do not, we should not recommend this bill. She said, it would be a lot of the alcohol, it would increase harms, it would not have a child abuse. Department of Health never passed that along to legislatures. So the legislature debated this issue without access to the one expert basically in the department who would say anything about that. And they passed the bill, so to go to the governor to sign it. And again, it's not all the all this was a fundamental amount of two million one thing in each year. We I think it's a little bit more important. This is all with each one. Governor ignored this amount of sign the bill. That speaks, I think, to a little bit perhaps in that moment, but also kind of in general, the legislature here has favored. The interest that fell out of all and offered to them all say was more than had the people that are harmed by it. And if you want to get another look at this, this is the Department of Health's press releases that I obtained, 1700 press releases that are already on the top of it. And if you look, I took a look at that, there's a whole lot of changes. But this is over the last um, 10 years as well. Alcohol, there's 1,700 this is going one in five people of working age in New Mexico. How can the Department of Health be talking so little about this issue? Well, another issue is clearly how our politics function. And our politics in the state involves the legislature, right? That is a volunteer legislature. Um, who are working their tails off 60 days, 60 days a year, three days every other year, and, um, and in between trying to make decisions in the citizen legislature, but who depend on political campaign contributions to run, run for re election. And when you look at the campaign money, and this is really reported by the industries, um, um, alcohol businesses have given them a lot of just six big alcohol businesses have actually done $750,000 over the last 10 years. You can see the ups and downs based on the election cycle. That's why they're going up and down. Um, and they have the best lobbyists in town. This last year, we watched the alcohol lot, um, interest were represented by of the 35 lobbyists that they call the super lobbyists in San Diego for their experience in longevity, hired 10 of them. Folks who were married to the legislators in front of whom they were presenting, people who had been former legislators or staffers themselves and who knew as colleagues or as friends sometimes for decades 
the people who they were appealing to. Um, and the folks that were out there were trying to fight for changes, I'd say arguing that the public health demanded it, did not hire any lobbyists. They are citizens, doctors, clinicians like you. So the story, the story telling, I guess, is to convert this research that I've done into something that people can digest. I would say the few lessons that I would offer is one, meet the audience where they're at. And through my reporting process, you know, I'm I'm trying to learn about a new issue, but I'm also trying to remember what it's like to not do anything. Because you really want to be able to communicate to that kind of person. Um, and so from that, we decided the themes that we we're going to talk about in the first batch of stories were the ones that seem like an average New Mexican would want to know about. Why is this state so horrific? What's the deal with PW? How big a part of this is that? What have we done? In a state where violence and crime have been taught on an issue, now it's a few minutes statewide. Why don't we hear people talking about it? Considering it's involved in 30% of the homicide, 3% of suicide. What are the stereotypes and the foreign way that we think that about all the native populations? And then how does that uh, affect our approach to this following the communities of the state? The family says this, and I don't know this and how difficult it is to make change. But we don't just diagnose the problem without providing a solution. I'm a big here in sort of solution journalism. So the first series of threads culminated with a piece that, that you can find online and made by a principal PDF, which is what do experts think the state can do? Not only in that one in terms of public health funding, but also. The state of all epidemiologists spent out 20 years. People who have had successful careers in the state of New Mexico and the state of New Mexico thinking about, you know, what to say about it. You know, um, and so you know, offering some ideas, I suppose, for people to recognize that we do, we should have some advocacy of kind of addressing this in, in some ways that we perhaps are not. And then we just kept reporting, um, following the legislature in the run-up to their session to hear what the most influential lawmakers were saying about this, to see the governor's office propose an, a, an office of alcohol prevention for the Department of Health, tracking as the problem got worse, answering questions the legislature raised, for example, are alcohol taxes regressive? Do they disproportionately harm poor people, which is an argument progressive lawmakers have made as well as alcohol interests, and which turns out to be Nuance that they are they are technically regressive as all, all consumption taxes, but the benefits are disproportionately for poor people. And because, in fact, wealthier people drink more than poor people in New Mexico, the the, the burden of alcohol related uh, of alcohol taxes does not fall disproportionately on the first part of the population. Um, and then, as I pointed out, sort of how the, the alcohol industry um, operates up, up there. Had a benefit of again reaching, I think, a wide audience through newspapers in the state, both in the state capital. Never thought we would run a, a line graph on the front of the pages, but very proud to do that. And then, but then also we got independent um, in the south of the state. We were really we benefited from having um, uh, help from the papers there. And then it was really cool. Our my editors supported us to print the entire series as a magazine, and we delivered one copy to all 109 legislators right before the session. Um, there's a mailman at the round house taking them. So we were assured that there was uh, no excuse for not having seen seen some of this information. Um, the editorial board of the New Mexican, particularly, has been writing a lot about alcohol and alcohol taxes in the time of the reporting since. There's been some key lawmakers who have reckoned, who have acknowledged, I think, that this is eye opening for them. And one thing I will say is, you know, there's a lot of information and a lot of things getting decided up there. And this is a legislature without a lot of staff, without, without staff, basically. And the expertise like that you have in this room is sorely needed. If you can package it in a way that people out there can understand it, you can move, you can move the mountain. Out of it. But clearly that act of translation is super important too. And the and information is not enough. I'll get to that. And you know, we've been this has been recognized by the Association of Healthcare Journalists as a as an impactful series too. 
Um, so what happened in the last 60 days? The legislative session ended two weeks ago. Maybe you're still um, catching up. I was watching it very closely. If you're interested, entering the session, as I mentioned, the Department of Health asked for $5 million to get for the first time to create an office of alcohol prevention. $5 million sounds like a lot to me, I take it, but um, it's not a lot compared to the billions of dollars that alcohol costs the state, the hundreds of thousands of people who need some treatment, but it's a big start. From having one alcohol epidemiologist, this office potentially would have 13 full-time employees. And then legislators introduced, as they had in 2017, a, a proposal to increase those alcohol taxes from where they are, four cents or eight cents, to 25 cents. So, is that, is that a lot or not a lot? It's a big change from a really no, low number to dramatic relative jump. Although quarter a drink is still where I'm from anyway, you know, that's not a lot. It's not going to change the price of alcohol too terribly much. But the, the modeling suggested one it would raise $25 million, and the legislators that sponsored it wanted to devote that tax treatment and prevention. And um, it would change behavior. That marginal change they estimated would greatly, greatly reduce the number of people that are developing alcohol use dependency and would reduce mortality measurably in the years to come. Well, this, this effort went through a series of committees, and unlike the past efforts in 2017, which got killed right away, this effort, this particular bill passed its first committee pretty easily. It went to both tax committee, the Senate and House tax committee, where the legislators tried to get it packaged into the omnibus tax package. The one bill where they made a lot of changes to the tax code this year, and everybody expected that to pass. But some things happen along the way. And what, we actually published a story on this today, but I'm not give you all the details. You should go to the next internet or um, Twitter to read about it. But, there's a critical math error made in the, in the rush that, that hamstrung the effort. And then some legislatures, once it got whittled down to just the conference committee negotiating the final changes, had a lot of influence on it. Um, and specifically, what started as a 25 cent tax, not reduced in the Senate to a five cent tax. And then the final conference committee, yeah. legislators decided on a 20% increase. 20% of a little is 20%. Is a fifth of oil. It's very less than a penny per grain increase per year. But hardly more than that is going to scare And like I said, inflation is eating away at this each year, right? In two years from now, nearly all that increase will have been already shows you how trivial I think arguably this this increase was. Instead of raising $175 million, it's going to raise $10 million. Because we drink so much that how much a penny a grain increase. And to the bill's credit, it still creates an alcohol harms alleviation fund in which not only that money, but some of the existing alcohol tax revenues are deposited for treatment and prevention purposes, which can be combined with federal Medicaid funds to potentially, potentially, it's not going to reach that, but potentially $100 million each year for alcohol treatment and prevention. And I'll just say, you can get a Medicaid match, but usually for services that you're delivering to individuals. Right? You gotta be treating somebody in the Medicaid program. That means prevention is really left out of this. Prevention is gonna be the thing that is probably least likely to get funded from this, even though this, I'm sort of showing you there's a lot of role for funding and prevention probably is playing this. Um, and kind of embarrassingly, the state did not even appropriate that $5 million for office of alcohol prevention in a year with a historic budget surplus. The chairman of the um, House. Appropriations committee wrote me to say, you know, we can't fund everything. Um, so the Department of Health says they're going to find two million dollars in their budget to at least create a watered down version of this office. Um, and this just shows you, I guess, where the total started, where it ended up, so you how know, it traversed over time. Um, this is the fateful vote in the conference committee where just six legislators were ultimately the two tax care people and Senate Majority Leader, four, four Democrats, two Republicans, uh, voted to cut that five cent tax down to less than a penny. And just so you remember who they are, <laughs> in total, this group has received $34,000 in alcohol in the last 10 years, um, including Jen, uh, Representative Harper, Rio Rancho Representative Lennox, and David Butler, who are the 
top recipient of alcohol dollars in the entire legislature, except for uh, Representative Patty Lundstrom. So that's the unmistakable influence. This is what the alcohol tax increase looks like. The, the tax, again, just put in proportion. Um, but to the story is, you know, never, there's never concluded. And the, uh, the sponsors of the bill, the story, if you look it up today, say that they are more committed than ever pursuing this kind of change and building a broader coalition. I think it was criticized perhaps by being led by one Anglo sponsor from the top of the state, a Hispanic senator, but from you know the Rob Hill area, we have census area actually. Um, there was Chan Pinto, senator from the uh, western part of the state, was on the bill, but I think um, was widely perceived as coming into the legislative session like this. You usually don't get what you want for a session anyway, but there's a need to build a broader coalition if, if the Democratic caucus wants to pass it. So a lot of opportunity for folks who are interested in running like to get involved in the work in this volunteer led effort, which I'm sure will continue in the coming years. Um, and why do I think that this probably will remain of interest? Well, the alcohol related death rates in the state of these are not raised. We have in 2021, last year data that were measured, um, where will it be next year? Um, you know, looking back and not only to the problem of that five years ago, where will we be in the future? But it also gives the Mexico a huge opportunity. We're we're a canary in the coal mine, I would say, nationally, from this issue and the things that the state done is my video on the WI could ultimately be coming your whole standard for other places. Um this is some of the ways we're trying to other countries sometimes within the state kind of really similar with this part of other states. So I'll just offer some concluding observations, and then I love if there's a few questions, you know, I'd love to hear from you all. Um, from my observation, what journalism can do is that hopefully I highlighted um, we can elevate expertise. You know, we don't have to uh, hopefully we can identify the people in that stuff and raise their voices up. Can focus the the public's attention, um, including with the help of the topics to really give us that hot and good. Um, and can I connect the dots? Because clearly there's a lot written and known about this issue, but sometimes it's helpful to see it all together. Um, hopefully, we also at least can show when people make mistakes or do selfish things or do things that aren't very public spirit. Um, I think my experience with that to a degree, we can sort of create fair terms of debate. You know, we could try and define the problem in a way to see the most rational and reasonable to look at, it, but you have. A lot of pushback from folks who want to see this in terms of their perspective. I said, I don't want this street to scribe this you do very differently. And they said, really, you know, lots of their hands of responsibility and that's what you very different. Um, to the degree journalists think and brought in public knowledge, but I mean, I'll tell you, if you went into the legislature and asked people around the city, you know, we had a big community where that the sophistication of this magic level of education is not great. So there's only so much you can only do to change the one people know about this issue. Um, and then hopefully in some kind of make people turn around their fellow citizens. I think you can kind of compassion um, for people, so many of us who personally or indirectly are impacted by this. Things that journalism can do is we really can't change the way the power is distributed in the state. And this issue, I think, really clearly shows. Power in the legislature does influence the way that politicians act, and people who are harmed by alcohol have very little power uh, for so many reasons. But this entire movement around addressing this is hampered by lack of philanthropic support, by frankly, a silent community that is the highest levels, and I'm sure the way it's been shown to in some cases, really, by the alcohol industry. Um, and to, to defend the interests of a scattered, a huge group of people who are scattered and, as I said, folks in stigma. Um, and we're some of the big recovery organizations, most important recovery groups, deliberately turn away from the press and politics for their own reasons. But, you know, that makes it hard to organize. It makes it hard to organize when Alcoholics Anonymous, for example, when the first principle is not to engage in the press or the politics position. Um, 
But I do think that small groups of people who are hardworking, persistent, and strategic really can make a change because I've seen it done. And um, I know that there are people at, in the state that, that want to do that. So, yeah, happy to Maybe then we'll just get a few questions. Can I take a few questions and I'll answer them once and I'll start here? Yeah. We have sure. Oh, no, I'm going to repeat your question after you say it. So, I like to apply the Pareto principle to systems improvement. And your the wonderful data there you show, you know, it's liver disease that's killing half, and then there's other, other causes like suicidality and so forth. It, Strikes me that the, I think they're saying hypothesis that dehydration is is a uh, thing that would exacerbate liver conditions. And if you look at the states, I googled it, that have these, these problems with alcohol-related liver deaths, that the dry ones have it elevated. Mm -hmm. And if you look at access to clean water on our reservation, something like forty-eight percent of folks don't uh, don't have access to clean water. So you start putting those ideas together as a as another hypothesis of where you could intervene by basically having access to clean water and, and help guiding people on not getting dehydrated in dry states just drinking alcohol. Could we move the needle a lot versus trying to beat back alcohol explicitly? Because your data also show folks with we're about average in consumption, but our the, the medical outcomes are way worse. So that anomaly has to be explained by another factor. Maybe not just that one, but that might be an interesting approach. I think that's a really interesting observation. Really, there's a sign on saying that perhaps because the uh, high rates of alcohol related disease in Mexico, because of both a lot of the language between dehydration and alcohol related liver disease. And because I would take the highway from the body of these other clients that are clients, maybe there's no relationship there. I, would, I can't be to the sign of that. I would say that in general, um, like that's the thing a lot of what you mentioned, and uh, really it's so cool to kind of come this whole. Um, clearly, I'm very happy to talk all the way over some kind of over, um, over step by step. I skipped. Sort of answering the question of why alcohol related deaths in New Mexico are so high. Parts of it because there's really all the experts in the world can tell me a single satisfying explanation for it. It is, of course, a constellation of factors they would say between we do have different based in native populations here. I mean, we do have rates of animals, high rates of substance, other kinds of substance use, and substance use, and extremely high rates of alcohol, uh, average childhood experiences and trauma in the state, which the predator of alcohol dependence uh, later in life. And then some just said what they would say the arms paradox cases that are you know, more the constellation of poverty, but at least resilient to addressing certain responding to these kinds of arms, right? And I think that in terms of you know if you're a person and criminals with animal structure and you know so say kind of the problems when you develop an alcohol use disorder. You're much better off than a person that doesn't have all those various safety nets. And even if you can very few safety nets compared to other places, I think part of what I see in the arms is comes back to not only lack of access to clean water, water, but also a lot of the other areas of disadvantage in the state. Um, the gentleman in agreement is going to avert. Yeah. Yeah, the data on alcohol related deaths is effective. Um, there's a wonderful tool on the CDC website that creates a methodology for populating alcohol related deaths. But I'm getting into the word maple and sticking my foot in my There are some points of alcohol related deaths where we say there's a bunch of language. You know, alcohol liver disease, uh, it's a, a huge like, alcohol application. Those kind of did not be said to get alcohol. And if you look at it, just those deaths, you know, it's a lot. But if you want to get the biggest, most expansive view of alcohol, you have to say that's why I'm looking at alcohol attributable deaths. We're calculating that in all attributable functions for certain kinds of positive deaths. And we say from this CDC methodology, which is updated from time to time, I don't know, 
and it is applied in states even though we've run out of time and then they want a different state to say based on less science and not all alternative in all alternative positive that. And then you take a look at it and talk with the CDP folks of it. I spent a lot of time trying to get like, ideas of the data error. Is the international amount of fire of the system of measurements? And, and the top people nationally in the state say no. It's a variety of measures growing out there. And those are estimates, of course, of the rates that are not perfect, but if anything, they underestimate how far the bottom of our schools. Here and then we could be legalized um, in the recreational cannabis. You can imagine that could act as a substitute, or you could imagine that you can batch based polydoxes or not a national experiment if that's around the country in the The question is about um, how cannabis legalization here in the state and in another state. It's the same thing of all uh, use and alcohol. And I would say, I have now uh, personal experience. Uh, in a way, and I gave the Congress and we've seen people present on this. And my thing was that you were the one who understood a lot of uncertainty. And I heard some people in the 80s more of a common necessity making this legalization as much as you're not seeing a reduction in the quality of consumption. I mean, the population level also I thought I'm going to say I'm very interested in that question as we could all be. Um, I think also just the way that we regulate alcohol, I think now it is with this state as in any other sort of trap in the regime of how we regulate alcohol sales that we set up a long time ago. We created this license system. We created this license system that created sort of uh, medallions for people to sell alcohol. And now we can't undo it because all these, these licenses are so valuable. We can't take them back from the business of the habit. And I think that is, is in what you think about how do you license cannabis sales? Are you going to create a regime that will be impossible to regulate later? Um, and because it's moving so fast, I guarantee you're going to make mistakes. Yeah. And why is there more attention to the impact of alcohol and the alcohol abuse? On children in Mexico. Why is there isn't there more attention to the impact of alcohol abuse on children in Mexico? Is the question. And I'm trying to. I was going to say I'm guilty of this as well because the series didn't focus in, in much on the children. Although I did profile a young woman who grew up in an environment where alcohol had and violence were. Had a big impact on her and, and had a big role in her dominant alcohol disorder later in life. I, I think, um, the, in general, our politics and our journalism would favor attention to children because it's, it's pretty much shown historically that if you want to have a successful social movement, focus on its impact on kids. You know, the original movement to address alcohol prohibition, right, focused on women and children. The big Im impact that we've had on DWI, you know, and the victim rights and uh, movement often focus on children. Civil rights movement folks, you know, when children get involved, that's when you, when you get attention. Um, and the press certainly covers things that affect children. Maybe partially it's because of epidemiology, this issue does, does, it does have such a catastrophic impact later in life that we see more focus on reporting of older, older people, older men. But, um, yeah, I think it's a big opportunity and probably one I should be thinking about more. Uh, yes, actually, let me go over here first and then I'll come back to you. Yeah. Hi. So a lot of the data we presented was more focused on deaths due to alcohol abuse. I was wondering if you have pretend, potentially looked at the impacts on our healthcare systems, both here in New Mexico and nationally. Sorry. Tell me the question one more time. <laughs> So a lot of the data you presented was more about the deaths related to alcohol use disorders. Um, have you potentially looked at the impacts on our healthcare systems due to alcohol use? Yeah, the question is, I focus very much on deaths and what about the broader impacts on the health system? And I'm probably am guilty of, uh, of focusing on deaths in part because we meant, you know, we commanded what we measure, and we measure deaths pretty well. And so that's, although the tip of the iceberg are the kind of most irrefutable, arguably, measure 
uh, to compare as an metrics to ISR to these other states, but they don't capture clearly the much broader impacts. And um, the best estimates of the cost that alcohol use disorders have on New Mexico, you know, they cost this out 10 years ago, they cost it out $2 billion. It's written proportional to deaths and adjusting for inflation. We spend more than $10 billion a year. Like, we're spending more than the uh, state budget to reflect this year on the harms of alcohol in the state. Um, so, I clearly, you would know better than I, I see it in your daily work. Um, I think the trouble is just quantifying that. And then, and then accessing health and environment is part of the year. Let's navigate in. Rightly, um, increased inflammations in the patient's individual well being, mental illness, and concern for us, and so forth. But um, I've been always open to pictures and hearing more about how to be a good time to stay. You all probably know this, you know, but what people aren't going to, and some of the best sources you may work at the UN, I see you, I don't know, who um, anyway, clinicians who are really seeing this. Um, so last year, a friend of mine uh, reached out to uh, the Medicare program, Medicaid, uh, for alcohol use. Uh, and I was told it would be months before they were seen and actually passed away in the meantime. Uh, I'm noticing that most of the models you're talking about are essentially kind of preventative. They're meant to alcohol use. Do you see policies or tools that we can talk about to help people already in crisis or do you consider it better to focus more on what it's going to do? No, I mean, what I present is clearly not a comprehensive debate. And if anything, I probably would moderate it to focusing on sort of primary prevention only because I thought like there's less discussion about it. And given the evidence, um, it's opportunities and and I seem clearly to be out of a lot of the ways that we support efforts. It needed to be sort of elevated. I think treatment in the most sort of like simplistic terms is that you're in that monitor the major factor on most of what you can talk to the with. Um, and it's because we still really do see how the alcohol use is the thing that like, certain group of people have kind of like, and we can treat them. Not that we can see the question of alcohol use disorder, but much broader. And a broadly experience, and you know, that is an uncomfortable acknowledgement for people, people, you know, who I know probably closely, who I think probably will have had an alcohol use disorder, but wouldn't consider that something that I'm going to be very upset. So, um, and yeah, the state clearly has, is not a place where it's easy for a person needs to access the kind of treatment on the floor, and the treatment is most appropriate for them. But the State government is sort of out of the plan. A lot of among those other things that we encourage us to do is to see more clinicians offering brief intervention and, and consequences on alcohol use disorders. Um, the alcohol office that the department of health is going to stand up is certainly going to be spending a lot of money trying to expand that sort of policy. And for what is worth, you know, one morning, which I have seen for the first time, I think I'm kind of the human service is going to be like, I'm not all right. He told me that there's you know, this money and an opiate um, several dollars that are coming to the state. There is truly an opportunity to close on treating it for the next few years. So it's very like your comments want to be repeated because that's just such a kind of and terrible thing to have to work with. Um, and, you know, everybody in the life is just to more kind of access to treatment and to be able to be made well. We are seeing significant like well, it's hard to imagine. I, I will say, I don't feel like I have a satisfactory measure of what where that is. The money comes from various places, what is where the treatment dollars, where the treatment activities. But I do know that I've heard of $5 million to pay. You know, that's going to be in that fund. They want to they want to spend it on the treatment for the Medicaid population. We'll get $31 million. We have $3 million for the population. Um, and the state and the governor of office from this seems to be an area that she personally is very interested in treatment as well. So I can't say that I've seen it happen, but I think it's opportunities. So. Yeah. Okay, I just have probably a question for one or two more. Yeah. Here's a follow up on the cost of healthcare. Uh, I myself have a brain injury. 
from a, a snowmobile wreck when I was at Brinkley. I'm from Gallup, from Canada, USA. And one of the things that I've been seeing and I really believe that one of the primary problems that we have with alcohol in the streets of Gallup are brain The diagnosed brain So, and, and that's also looking at spinal cord injuries. So, really, the long term impact. Uh, it, it's sad and tragic that people die, but there's hundreds, thousands of people with spinal cord injuries and brain injuries that are going to cost for the rest of their lives. It's going to cost somebody, but uh, especially how we can get some way to identify people like a gap, like in Gallup. I've been saying this now for a lot of years, and it just kind of goes. Oh yeah, we should do something, but we really got to do something because there's a ton of well, there's a lot of people that are on the streets, uh, especially in Gallup and Brain Yeah, that's what I really appreciate the comment, which just to summarize uh, brain injuries being something that some that they're maybe a lot more common than people recognize, including those that alcohol was mediating in the head injury, and then. And exacerbate, I imagine, uh, something to be player in. I think, um, you know, that's piece, as a reporter, I kind of have a myopia on this topic because you kind of want to be focused and simplified. But clearly, this how long you have the interface with when you come out of the state when it comes to injuries, when it comes to violence, and to like, know that this is a woman in the street, it's a part of one way to go on the way and make sure that there's. Opportunities to study and to measure those. Um, okay. I'll stick around. Great. Here is everyone. Please, you can find me on Twitter. I'll be here. Thank you. Thank you.